Welcome back. We are talking about learning and memory this time. It's a couple chapters for you, remember, six and seven. Uh, so review both of those and hope you did well in the midterm quiz. Uh, if not, just go back and redo those PowerPoints a couple times, get those concepts in, and go through the key terms in the back of your book as well and make sure you, uh, you know, memorize all those terms that could pop up on the final exam. Anyways, getting back to the point, we're talking about learning and memory, and we'll try to get through this a little bit quicker than I have been previously. Um, first of all, learning itself, remember, is any sort of permanent change, right? It's either you know crystallized knowledge that you're building into your database of names and faces and stuff, um, but it's through experience, right? Um, one thing that's important to realize about this is it's maybe not immediately evident to you that you have changed. Uh, sometimes, like with my graduate students, it takes a semester or two for them to realize what they learned um, before and how those skills and abilities are building up. Um, but it's any relative change that happens to you based on some experience. Um, so if you do training at work, as you know, I'm an IO psychologist, remember, so I teach training and do a little training for people. You want to see that there's some change based on what you train people to do. Either they know their job better, they know the concepts better, um, or they're affectively different in some way, whether their values uh, have changed or their attitudes may be more positive. Um, but there's a lot of different cognition you can also build in. So of course the early days of this started with classical conditioning, named classical for a reason, basically looking at associations between stimuli. So the classic Pavlov's dog, right? Um, any arbitrary stimulus can be paired to create some sort of uh, response, right? And it's um, all about that paired association between uh, anything that could be innocuous or mundane with something that naturally produces a reaction, like food produces saliva, but the food can be paired with bells or research assistants or whatever that then can really produce that reaction that the original uh, stimulus did to begin with, right? Um, so it's that association, right? Two stimuli, a neutral stimulus paired with some sort of um, uh, unconditioned stimulus. Uh, that then becomes the condition stimulus over time, producing the condition response. You know, so the more times you pair that mundane or neutral stimulus, the more of an association you get uh, with the meat powder producing the saliva. Uh, so the fourth key terms really here are those unconditioned, conditioned um, sort of stimulus and unconditioned and conditioned response, right? The salivation. So, you know, he, he looked at this from the sense that we have these sort of reflexes, right? These uh, unconditioned sort of natural reflexes. And pairing these things, you know, in this case with food and, you know, digestive juices uh, done through the kind of creepy way of the little vial on the cheek, as you see there, uh, you can produce the stimulus through something else, right? Through, in this case, the little uh, monochrome sound or whatever would produce the salivation. You know, so this really helped us understand uh, sort of human behavior, right? So little Albert was the famous case where they were looking to see uh, how he was associating uh, furry rabbits or even fur coats by the end of the conditioning experiments with, uh, you know, fear. Um, and if they can counter condition or eliminate those fear responses. So this can be carried over to our physical health, you know, pairing associations um, with like smoking with environments or if you always smoke cigarettes at a party, um, you know, parties could make you start to crave cigarettes um, or, you know, the joyfulness of being at a party you could associate with the cigarette smoking. The, the stimulus and response things are all sort of like interchangeable based on uh, the chicken or the egg role that it plays. Uh, similarly with sexual arousal, things being paired with that, or phobias, like returning to the little Albert example. Um, you know, these things can change in their effect, you know, so uh, like with tolerances and things like that, they can build up and be degraded um, or degraded, I should say, uh, over time. Um, so the impact of a certain, you know, scary thing or drug impact on you could change over time. Uh, that's what we call sort of tolerance when it's weakened a little bit. Uh, operant conditioning is a slightly newer version where we were looking at you know, the reinforcement and your role of behavior in that. So, you know, the the behavior here is the important difference, not a sort of natural reaction that they focused on in classical conditioning. Um, so it's all about increasing future probability uh, of a behavior based on the sort of 
reaction you get in terms of positive negative reinforcement or punishment in terms of the reaction, right? So Thorndike was looking for a sort of a behaviorist explanation, if you will, um, explaining the process of learning in a different way. So classical as associations operant as sort of the behavioral version. Um, the four classical sort of uh, sort of reactions, if you will, are the positive reinforcement, right? So you know, you will clean your room more if you get pizza, right? Um, the opposite of that would be punishment, right? So, um, you know, a, a slap, uh, or in the case of not getting dessert, maybe, uh, for, you know, not doing something or doing something bad, and negative re uh, reinforcement being the opposite, sort of a positive reinforcement, where, uh, you know, you um, can remove something bad, let's say, by doing a behavior. So, you either getting a positive reinforcement or removing something negative from your life in the negative reinforcement side. Um, punishment, we don't seem to like as much. And I'll go back to that, but uh, punishment has never really shown to be super useful, even though it seems to be the easiest thing to sort of utilize uh, in most cases. If you've ever seen um, a dog misbehaving or a person or a child, um, a lot of our immediate reaction is punishment, uh, you know, smack the the thing, but that's sort of the worst thing to do, uh, and potentially illegal, of course, nowadays. Anyways, positive reinforcement, like I said, there can be different types of reinforcers, primary ones that are direct, you know, secondary ones like money that buy things that you really want, like food, uh, which would be a primary. And the sort of schedules of doing this can change dramatically from fixed, a one-to-one -one sort of ratio, uh, versus variable in terms of every few behaviors or random uh, numbers of behaviors of, that you're supposed to be doing would result in the positive outcome. A fixed interval would be every once in a a uh, certain time period and variable would be random time periods uh, you'd be reinforced with. And uh, of course, continuous is sort of just continually reinforced with each behavior, um, sort of like a fixed ratio sort of thing, but fixed ratio can be three to one um, or five to one, uh, where continuous would be a one to one ratio. There's other ways that they uh, sort of looked at sort of positive reinforcement in this way, shaping, uh, creating stacks of behaviors or chaining, you know, uh, various behaviors. Uh, that you sort of uh, chain together or link together that can then be rewarded to increase the likelihood of that. Um, the best example of this I can give is the cat videos online uh, where individuals are teaching them how to use a toilet, <laughs> a human toilet. Uh, you can teach them by shaping and chaining behaviors to where you get them to eventually sit on the seat and then uh, you can even get them to flush if you're a super skilled animal trainer, uh, which I am not. Like I said, punishment not always effective. It's that negative consequence that you would think would reduce the behavior, but in a lot of cases we see people then uh, associating punishment, let's say, with attention. So uh, if you're uh, devoid of attention, any attention, like in a school setting, uh, could create uh, the bad behavior to receive the attention as well as uh, mitigating the effect of the punishment, let's say, because you get the attention. Um, so you could reinforce uh, the punisher themselves. You could potentially, um, you know, create a generalized, what we call an inhibiting effect, so the, the student or the person doesn't do any behavior because they're not sure what's going to be punished, right? Um, and of course, you can then uh, develop some sort of dislike towards the person punishing you. Um, that makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, and it doesn't necessarily teach what they should be doing, um, it just teaches what they should not be doing, right? So uh, in addition to uh, stacking sort of negativity, which we might call the criticism trap, uh, you also never teach them what they're actually supposed to be doing. Something like modeling, um, and I don't mean uh, Zoolander, I mean modeling behaviors, uh, does maybe teach desired behaviors as long as they're modeling that desired behavior. Um, the classic Bobo doll studies by Bandura really showed how people can socially learn. So by watching a video of kids interacting with a Bobo doll negatively, they would react negatively. If the person reacted or acted and interacted with the Bobo doll in a positive way, um, the children would be more likely to interact with it in a positive way. So that modeling or sort of, uh, you know, um, replicating the behaviors of their social peers um, was possible uh, and prevalent and was based partially on sort of the reinforcement and punishment that they saw uh, based on the people doing that. Uh, so you could reinforce somebody for doing something 
and then anybody watching that interaction basically could then be likewise uh, reinforced vicariously um, or punished, let's say, vicariously. Um, so that could be potentially problematic. There's also some biology involved in this, like most stuff. Um, so there's some natural sort of evolved um, sort of mechanisms for fear that have been uh, learned innately, which is kind of interesting. Um, but also, of course, like that can be by the environment. So uh, somebody that actually used to teach at my school, Counseling Long Beach, John Garcia, uh, the Garcia effect, or what's called sometimes taste aversion, is the, uh, the learned response to distaste something uh, very strong after one uh, interaction with it. So let's say if you uh, to have chemotherapy, that sort of nauseous reaction uh, being paired with a food could make you never want that food again. Uh, they, they did this to actually help sheep uh, by giving them a bad taste so that the coyotes wouldn't eat them anymore. Um, sort of an interesting example. Memory is sort of, once we learn something, how it translates to long-term storage, right? So that taste aversion I just mentioned is one of the strongest learned responses that is almost impossible to extinguish. So I learned a long time ago by eating a fig that I did not like figs, and I pretty much have never eaten one since. Um, I have not forgot that visceral experience of not enjoying it. Um, but memory in general is the retention of any information, right? So it could be anything from a skill, um, you know, uh, any sort of facts, you know, uh, to silly trivia that we use on trivia night, if you like going to those silly trivia night things. Uh, some of the earliest work on memory were by Eben Gauss, uh, who looked at sort of meaningless nonsense syllables and our ability to uh, memorize those. Uh, you know, I think the, the research basically showed us the 5 to 7, 5 to 9 uh, sort of limit to our abilities um, in terms of memorization. So, you know, 5 to 9 nonsense syllables. Now we know it's about 9 numbers as well, and that's why most phone numbers are set up to be um, 10 digits. You know, it's right on that um, extent of what we can memorize. But if you think of without the zip code, uh, they're all about 7 numbers. Uh, so that seven number is right that five to seven, five to nine range of what we can remember uh, accurately. And they test this through a lot of ways, you know, uh, recall all the way to, you know, you know, giving people hints. Um, they look at, you know, recognition things, basically, you know, a multiple choice exam like you took and will take again is a recognition sort of uh, test to see if, you know, you, you can spot the right answer amongst others, right? Um, sort of recall is just basically uh, maybe a short answer test, right? Um, and then there's more difficult or complicated ways of looking at this in terms of implicit memories and maybe explicit memories. Um, you may not know you have memories, but they could be in there. Um, so implicitly, um, you may not regard them as memories, they say, but you know the words implicitly or they're in your database whether you know it or not. We also talk about procedural and declarative memories. Procedural being the types of things like procedures, uh, using chopsticks, riding a bike, right? Declarative being like the names of states or states' capitals. Uh, like the idea of the what keys are next to a C. If you're not a real typist, you have no idea what's next to a C on a keyboard. Um, even I would have to put my fingers on the keyboard and think, okay, what would I be pressing if I pushed my finger down and to the left next to the C? Um, I think it's the space bar, but who knows? Anyways, the difference is basically, uh, you know, the type of memory that you're talking about and different parts of the brain uh, actually handle those things. When you get down to the, the basic level, it's still, you know, nerves and synapses and all that that are um, firing in your, in your cerebral cortex in those areas. And they think the smallest element of this is called the engram. Um, so that, that, that little bit that's formed or created uh, we say is the engram, engram of uh, memory. And, you know, basically those engrams are connections, right? So the more those connections are used, the more likely you are to uh, remember them, right? So the synaptic facilitation idea goes to the, um, the idea that you can, you can remember things more the more they're uh, utilized. Uh, so if you don't utilize information, there's no facilitation there. Uh, there's no firing potential uh, where the other neurons might be warmed up if you use them more likely. 
this kind of relates to a three stage uh, sort of memory theory that they've come up with where you know you encapsulate new information into your um, short term memory and once it gets into your short term memory it hopefully will then um, be stored in your long term memory. Um, but short term memory is really uh, sometimes called working memory. Working memory is somewhere between short term and long term but it's the idea that you have a uh, sort of a a table that you're chopping your veggies on or looking at your ingredients list and then you uh, put that back in the fridge or you put that in the, the frying pan uh, but that's either lost let's say if it's put in the frying pan and you forget about it or you put it in the fridge and it goes into long-term memory um, but I like that sort of chopping board uh, sort of analogy for a short-term memory Long-term memory, though, is that sort of procedural and declarative and episodic memory, so the, the way you do things, the facts you, you know, or uh, what some people call episodic memories, those things that, you know, a, a flashbulb memory of something happening to you, a, a breakup that you had, or a car crash. Um, those things are sort of, you know, stories that you tell or episodes in your life, right? Uh, semantics are more like, you know, principles and facts and uh, those sort of more declarative types of things. Anyways, the short term being the storage, so you don't think about necessarily those uh, those types of short term memory because it's just a, a, a short term storage area like short term parking or that uh, cutting board that eventually gets put away. Anyways, once it gets into that long term memory, that's the encoding process, um, which can be affected by emotions. So arousal or emotional arousal changes the way that we encode information and retrieve information uh, that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, there's different, you know, sort of mechanisms to this. Uh, you know, some of the basics are like primacy and recency, you know, remembering the first thing in a list or the last thing in a list, or the first person you kissed or the most recent person you kissed, but not number, you know, seven or four, um, that person you may not remember at all. We also tend to, you know, remember very, uh, sensory arousing or unusual things, unusual people, or those things that excite the neurons, um, those can help. Uh, and then of course cues help with this, right? So we talked about encoding specificity. So anything that's associated with it could be a cue or a specific environment could be a cue, um, which we sometimes call context dependence. So, you know, studying in a room uh, that's blue for a test um, will help you take a test in a room that's blue, uh, as silly as that sounds. Um, or having a friend around that you studied with, having them in the test could be sort of a retrieval cue uh, to help you remember those facts on the test. For y'all, you may want to have a uh, little doll or something or a stuffed animal <laughs> that you study with and then have on your desk as you uh, take the exam. Uh, some other tips, you know, might be spreading out that study session and that's of course, one reason why I say don't try to do the class in three uh, total days or something, because uh, you need time to process that information. Um, of course, you know, mixing up the conditions, mixing up your context can help. Um, note taking is help because it helps uh, encode the, the graph that I showed you a couple slides ago. It talks about rehearsal, rehearsing information from, you know, the sort of stimulus stage to the short term memory stage will help you then encode that. Um, and then of course, uh, learning in different ways too. I think these are some interesting sort of studying tips. In terms of retrieval, we have some interesting uh, concepts that come up such as hypermnesia, um, which is actually getting specifically good memories related to uh, maybe a traumatic event or a situation. Um, so knowing the exacts of something, um, you know, versus maybe what's called uh, hindsight bias, where you think you uh, knew exactly what was going on, even though now once you have the facts, it's really based on that more so than your recall ability, um, which Fry is illustrating there at the bottom. Um, and then reconstruction has a lot to do with our affects. So we talked about affect and emotion in the you know encoding process. The retrieval is also very um, susceptible to be being biased by our um, expectations or affects. Um, so, you know, if you're happy today, remembering an event five years ago is colored by your present happiness uh, in some ways. Getting to the sort of last stage of memory, if you will, which is forgetting. <laughs> uh, forgetting ha happens for a lot of reasons. 
you know, one of them is interference, you know, interference is the idea that, you know, you're not able to retrieve the information, so it's gone. Um, so a cause of forgetting could be that there's interference in some way, either proactive or retroactive. So something that you learned now uh, is maybe interacting with uh, that previously learned fact in the proactive case. Uh, we also repress things and we disassociate. Um, so we may disassociate memories with people or events with ourselves. So dis dislocating or disconnecting um, certain memories uh, to maybe protect our psyche, as Freud might argue. Um, and we also repress those things, right? So we just don't seem to remember them for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, through maybe hypnosis or psychological therapy, uh, people can remember things that they didn't realize they even knew. Um, therapists encounter this a lot where, you know, people start talking about their motivations and their sort of difficulties and uh, realize through talking things out that um, things happen that they had forgotten or had, you know, really pushed down um, and sort of um, really consciously um, forgot, but uh, they can bring it back to that conscious mind. And finally, of course, some of this is biological and uh, um, sort of chemical. You know, amnesia comes from a lot of different sources. There's a lot of, you know, research in Alzheimer's now and the chemicals that we, um, even dyes that we ingest affecting things like Alzheimer's, um, as well as, you know, hippocampal functioning. Um, amnesia in general, though, is just the loss of information or uh, in some cases sort of a, like an anterior grade amnesia that's, you know, where you're really not able to uh, retrieve new information um, or store new information, really, in long-term memory. So you can't create new um, facts, um, like crystallized uh, memories in your, in your uh, storage facilities there. Uh, there's some interesting ones like Korsakoff syndrome um, related to alcoholism, where it's a, you know, a loss of a vitamin and it creates sort of um, nonsensical speech, what they, what they call confabulation, and uh, of course uh, some mental difficulties. But a lot of these, uh, you know, hopefully uh, will be increased through what we know about, you know, genetics as well as um, the dangerous toxins that we ingest in the air and the foods and whatnot that could be creating these um, these things like Korsakoff syndrome related to alcoholism, uh, Alzheimer's disease could be related to a lot of other things that we're ingesting or experiencing. Anyways, hope this was enjoyable and I'll see you soon.